Welcome to another episode of Get a Good Start. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Get a Good Start. Visit us on getagoodstart.com for the accompanying blog to this podcast, which provides additional information about my guests, links to the information we discuss, and ways you can put into action what we talk about here on the show so you can get a good start. If you're a fan of history and learning interesting facts about forgotten places and things, my next guest may be very familiar to you. Besides being an engineer, an endurance sports enthusiast, and an amateur woodworker, he is a TV presenter who can be seen on one of my favorite TV shows on the Science Channel, Mysteries of the Abandoned. Welcome to the show, Rob Bell. Rob, thanks for joining me today. Thanks very much for having me, Scott. Lovely opportunity. Oh, this is exciting to have you on. And I'm going to start this off like I start off every interview. What does getting a good start mean to you as it applies to your workday? My, my work days can be quite varied. Um, I mean, I'll take my work day as being when I'm out on shoot. So I'm out filming somewhere and typically that's on location, um, which for me, because of what I do, my kind of history, engineering, science documentaries, it normally means I'm out and about somewhere, um, sometimes in the middle of nowhere, staying in a kind of cheap hotel. Um, so for me, a great start to to the day for me is a slightly later call time. So <laughs> like a an, maybe an 8.30 call time, which means that I can get up, I can go out for a run in somewhere I don't know, which I love doing, finding a place to go out for a run, get some form of exercise in, get back, have a good breakfast, feel like I'm fully prepared and get something ticked off the to-do list by like eight o'clock and then start working the day. I find if I get if I get active early in the morning and I get a little bit of exercise done, I feel really good about myself and there's a there's a momentum that kind of builds then within the day because I can compare that to days where I don't get to do that and it just everything feels like a bit of a slog to get going. That's that's a good start to the day for me. You're on the science channel. I'm sure you've been privy to a lot of interesting technologies, but certainly you haven't come across a time machine yet. But if you did and you were able to go back in time and tell your younger self a little bit of advice that could help you out in in your future self's life, what would that piece of advice be? Well, I have to say my time machines got are um, they're very close to me because my favorite film in the whole wide world ever, ever, ever. And it will never be replaced is Back to the Future. I mean, it's it's, it's the perfect (laughs) film. Um, So that 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 for me, uh, it's it's a great question. It's something that I kind of think about quite a bit. 22, I would have been in my latter stages of being at university. Uh, my course was five years that I did because uh, I had a year out um, in, in industry. And I think, so it would have been about the time where I was starting to think about, you know, what, what am I going to go and do for a job when I finish my studies? And when I look back, I don't think I was very bold about my decisions or about the, the opportunities that, that were out there. I don't think I was necessarily very true to myself. And I don't think... I, I don't think I was really aware of the opportunities that did lie out in the big wide world. So, I mean, I didn't, I didn't take finding a job very seriously, in all honesty. Um, I finished university. I then took another year out to go off skiing and having a good time. And it was then when I had to start thinking about, right, I need, I need to do a job here. Um, I, I just don't think I had the confidence to think slightly more outside of the box than kind of like traditional jobs. Um, my, my parents had had office jobs and they'd been successful with that. Um, and I, I just don't think I, I thought, I thought very widely. I don't think I was very broad in, in, in how I was thinking. And so that's what I'd go back and tell myself, I think was to be, is to be bolder and have more confidence that I would be able to carve out some kind of career, some kind of means of making a living in areas that weren't necessarily traditional kind of job sets if that makes sense sure and i think i was just in that kind of mindset as i came out of university it's like you know your your path is kind of planned out you do your work you get your grades and you move on to the next stage i think that's how i saw that when i was 22 still i was kind of figuring well i'll just move on to the next stage and things will just kind of figure themselves out i don't necessarily regret i enjoyed my life from a 22 year old onwards i've had a good i've had a good a good set but I could definitely have been more proactive. And I, I kind of, I do wonder where I might be and what I might be doing now, had I been more proactive in that and not bumbled about for so long. What you're expressing is something I've heard other guests also express about being more bold or taking a chance, you know, uh, 
trying to focus in on one thing and try and fail at it and then move on to the next thing uh, instead of trying to have that set oh i have to go this like you said the next stage is pre-planned almost right i'm gonna do this and then this and then this but really go out and say well i want to try this yeah and if i fail i fail but let me learn something from it and move on to the next thing absolutely and i think i mean i kind of wish there was something that i had a fear of failing at but i don't think there was because i don't i just don't think i took that career side of my life very seriously at that time I, i'm okay with that but i i was always i say what i was always envious of my older sister who always knew exactly what she wanted to do and she tailored all of her studies when she was at um high school she tailored all of her studies towards that she, she wanted to be become a, a vet a veterinarian mm -hmm. And so she tailored all, all of her efforts towards that. She didn't get the grades to go into vet school um, uh, when she was 18. So she had to go and do um, a bachelor's degree, an undergraduate degree for three years in um, animal science, I think it was. And then she went to vet school for another six years. But she had this drive and this passion towards becoming this 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 profession and, and and seeing out that dream and she did it and she's a great vet now she's absolutely brilliant i'm so proud of her but i was always quite envious around this kind of time that she knew what she wanted to do and i didn't and i never really put the effort in to figure that out and it was kind of a frustration that i just kind of buried away in there i said oh it'd be all right type thing yeah until I, a point I, but we'll right. come on to that later yeah i uh because this, this is when I was 22 and I was just, bah. I tell my students and I particularly tell my son who's going off to college next year uh, to Penn State University. I tell him, give yourself the biggest, widest birth of opportunity. So if you change your mind, you don't have to change and upheave your whole life. Right. So I think part of that yeah. played into him going to a larger university instead of like me, I went to a very specialized college around design. Like if I wanted to change mid path to change over to be a vet, I would have had to pick up roots and go somewhere totally different, you know? So I think giving mm -hmm. yourself that wide berth of opportunity is important. You know, thinking about graduating college or knowing what you want to do in university, you know, if you could speak to, you know, this year's graduating class of every university, Rob, what one piece of advice could you give all these college students? what would it be? Would it be any different than the advice you would give yourself? No, it probably wouldn't. It probably wouldn't. And it probably follows on from what we we're just talking about. And I think it would be, it would be to try and to take, to take the time to try and understand what motivates you and what, um, what is it that you find rewarding in life? Um, and to try and pursue some kind of career in that direction and that and as you say that could be quite a broad direction it doesn't have to be specific but at least know you, you're working in some kind of direction that you are going to get enjoyment and a sense of achievement and reward from and that reward can come in many different guises i mean so i, I was how old i think i was probably about maybe yeah late 20s 28 when i got really really frustrated that I didn't know what I wanted to do. And so I actually sought out some career counseling to try and help me with that. And it's not like career counselors, uh, it was, it was expensive. I had to take out a credit card to do it and kind of do it, but it was important to me that I, that I did this. And it's not like they give you this kind of magic ticket. That's got all the answers on it. It all comes from within yourself, but they just help tease that out. And, and I'm not, um, <laughs> I'm not focused enough to sit down on my own and just do that. I needed some kind of mechanism, some kind of tool to tease and squeeze that out for me. So it was really useful for me, but it wasn't rocket science. You know, it's, it was about understanding myself. What were my motivators? What do I feel proud of that I've done in the past? What do I get a sense of achievement and reward from? And when you nail that down, you can say, right, okay, I understand myself now. What, jobs or careers or industries do i feel i'm going to get back what i feel that i i what i need or how i'm going to enjoy myself and a real important thing from that that came out for me was that i wasn't necessarily motivated by money which i'd always kind of assumed that i was without really thinking about it too much now that's not to say that you know i that i don't enjoy earning money to live a, a lifestyle that I enjoy and that, that gives me comforts and things that I want to do. That's great. I, I, I do want that, 
but I'm not motivated by money. I'm not driven by money. And it's fine if you are, because there are, there are jobs in their careers that, that will kind of give you that. But I don't, I, I wasn't chasing money, but I didn't know that until I sat and, and worked it all out. What I discovered about myself was that I, I enjoy some form of creativity, some form of, of um, producing an item and an element. And I enjoy other people getting enjoyment or entertainment from what I do. I do enjoy that. I enjoy that feedback. So that, those were really, really important things for me, which then led me to go, OK, well, maybe a, TV, a, a career in TV would be something for me. So so my advice to people graduating and, and starting to think about their careers and, and jobs and industries that they want to work in is to really take some time and ask yourself some questions about who you are and what motivates you and what drives you and use that as your foundation stone to uh, build a, a career uh, up from rather than the other way around, you know, oh, here's a job, you know, what, what will I get? out of it will I get out of it what, what I want does it pay well is it near home that kind of stuff nah doesn't matter you've got to flip it and 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 put yourself at the core of it that I think is absolutely fundamental to um having a, a career that will give you fulfillment let's talk about your mechanical engineering side we are all so engrossed in technology today more than ever right and it just exponentially increases and, in, and encroaches on our lives. How important do you think it is for students to get some exposure to computer coding? How can that experience add something of value to someone who's not in a technical field? Yeah, this, was a, this is a good question, Scott. And I, I kind of had an automatic answer that, that I just bleh, blurt out, which would have been, oh, look, coding doesn't really interest me personally. It doesn't, I'm not interested in the nuts and bolts of coding. So, and I've been all right. So I, I think it's okay. I don't think it's important. Everybody understands that. But then I started thinking about it a bit more. <laughs> and I think that is rubbish, Rob. Uh, you need to rethink your answer on that. So, so talking from a personal experience, the coding was part of, um, it was it was part of modules that I did at university studying for um, a master's in mechanical engineering. I didn't enjoy it in it, but it seems to me that almost every business concept or, um, or almost all business operations can be made more efficient and more effective by integrating uh, computer coding or um, some form of digital technology into the way that they that they work. It, 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 these days, it feels like well, in, in the world we live in now, it feels like that is that is a true statement. And I, I'm sure there are areas where that's that's not the case. But almost every business idea, it feels to me, can that there's there's room for digital technology to come in and, and help make things more efficient and, and, and more effective. So even if you're not that interested in the actual coding itself and, and writing, you know, lines and lines of code in order to bring out this these great functionalities for apps or programs or um, you know, websites, whatever it might be. I do feel that there's almost a fundamental need for almost everybody to understand the concept of coding and digitalization and to understand the limitations and the capabilities of it so that you so that you're not left out in the cold because it feels like digital engineering, digital technology is is so integrated into almost everything in the world we live in now. And so, it's important that that you can understand how it integrates with whatever it is you do so that you can communicate well with the people who are doing the coding um, and that you're not left a little bit, I guess, perplexed. It would be good if you're not perplexed by it or, or frightened by it. So you don't have to be interested in the nuts and bolts of it, but I think it's important that everybody understands the concept of it and at the kind of base, at its base, it's, its capabilities and its limitations so that you you can you can help integrate it into whatever business processes or operations that, that you work in i totally agree i think the ability of someone to understand those concepts can communicate better with the people who develop them so they're not you know wrapping all their ideas around a blanket statement saying uh just go just go make me an app 
you know yeah well, we can't yeah, make yeah, yeah. and then when somebody <laughs> turns around and says well we can't make an app that does that oh yes you can oh yes you can you can and they they have you know i think the understanding of the limitations understanding of the basic concepts i think is very could be very valuable no different than having an architect understand or an engineer understand that when two pieces of wood or metal go together this way they work and if they go together this way they don't or something like that you don't have to understand how to put the the nail in the wood but you need to know that those concepts of post and lintel or you know i beam construction yeah. versus an engineered beam you know how what do they do for me you know and i think yeah. having that little bit of understanding on some some people may say could be dangerous but i think it's enlightening because it makes everyone speak in, on a common plane yeah you you you're basically raising the 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 level of that common plane of communication rather than someone trying to communicate up here and someone down there where and they understand the the the, the gap in understanding is absolutely massive if you could reduce that gap slightly then you've got a better chance of having a, a more positive outcome i feel and it's interesting you 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 kind of use the advan the example of um and engineers and architects i mean historically structural engineers and architects don't necessarily get on because right. they, they're both trying to achieve the same thing they're just trying to achieve like this massive great let's say it's a train station i do a lot of stuff of railway history let's say it's a massive great big beautiful train station and um you know the architects are coming in need to look like this and the structural engineers go yeah but we've got these limitations of materials and you know the environment we're working within and there's this kind of there's this there's this difference in in understanding of what they're trying to do. they're both trying to achieve the same thing but if right. you could bring the, the the gap between them them smaller um then you've got a better chance of of working it out there are industries like pharmaceutical industries for example that use digital engineering all the time and it's it's reduced the it's reduced the lead time to bring a product to market. You can use digital engineering to run your models rather than having to develop expensive prototypes and do all your testing on a physical prototype. You can bring that in at, at stages, but you're not relying entirely on that. And you can put bulk of the work to digital engineering, which can do a lot of that for you in a much quicker time and much cheaper as well. So it, it's absolutely crucial right across the board. Thinking about crossovers, right? Thinking about, I learned this from that and now I can apply it to something else. Your experiences in endurance sports, I'm sure you've learned a lot about yourself. You've learned about a lot about mind over matter, visualization, a lot of different things. Certainly running seven marathons on seven continents in seven days was a test of not f only physical stamina, but mental as well. What is something or an experience that you had in the sports world that translated over to something you applied to the business world? Yeah, good. That is. So I'll use seven, uh, seven, 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 the seven marathons challenge that I did as, as an example. Um, I remember crossing the finish line in Sydney in Australia after my seventh marathon and it was all it was all over. I thought, oh, thank goodness for that. Um, but also it was, oh, what am I going to do now? Because that had been a year of planning and working with uh, five great mates to make this, this thing happen. And then we went and did it and we achieved it and it was amazing. But I was so conscious that I was going to come home off the back of that and be really blue for weeks because my life had this massive void in it <laughs> all of a sudden. <laughs> um, so I was, I was really aware of that. So I made sure I had lots of stuff to, to come back to. Um, but I think I think what I was going to talk about that when I remember finishing the crossing the finish line and and there was a feeling of how 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 to put it there, there was a feeling of that there was a sense of achievement in what we'd done that that was so much bigger than the week we'd just spent running seven marathons because as I say, that, that was 12 months of planning to do that. And it was such a daunting task to get everything up and ready. Um, if I go back, roll back 12 months from crossing that finish line, if I was doing that on my own, or if I didn't have my teammates continuously kind of driving things forward, and there was this group momentum that I was certainly feeding off of without that, I, I don't think I would have ever achieved it just because the whole task seemed too big and too daunting. And I do suffer from that 
in life generally and, and, and with my work as well sometimes where I can become quite distracted if a task does seem quite big or a project seems quite big and there are multiple tasks to do within it. Um, but I, I do remember crossing that finish line and thinking, you know, I, personally, I've managed to do this because I had people driving me to, to just do it, to just do stuff, to get on with it and don't worry about it or fret about it or try or over plan it. Just, just kind of get on with it and, and, and do it. So there was, I, I, I kind of made a vow to myself at that finish line that I was going to try and incorporate that more into my everyday life. And I do, I, I mean, th- I'm working on a project right now um, within, it's a TV project. So my, my job at the moment is, is pretty much a television presenter. So I come in and I present the, the show in front of camera. I'm, I've recently started to become more involved as well in production of some of the shows, show all the work that goes on behind the camera to set everything up. And I'm working on a project like that just now. And it's, it's daunting. There's so much that needs to be done. There are so many details and I do get distracted by it. And I think I have loads of people to call who I've, I, they don't know who I am and I need to kind of cold call people and, and get something from them. And ask, And I get a bit daunted and a bit anxious about it, a bit scared of asking stuff from people who don't know me. But I've just had to kind of give myself that little boost. Come on. Remember what you said over in Sydney? You just need to do it. Just get on and do it. And so I have really tried and I do remember it. And that I've used that in my mind quite a few times in these last couple of weeks. And invariably, it's gone really well. And you pick up the phone and people are all too happy to hear from you. And, you know, I've had great conversations and made amazing connections with people who are going to help and make this project happen. But I can get distracted by that, by that anxiety or that I kind of almost want to call it. It's not a procrastination. It's not pure procrastination and laziness. I guess it's just worrying too much about um, about what the outcome is going to be. And am I prepared enough to just get on and do it? Does that, does that make sense, Scott? You've taken that sense of accomplishment and knowing that the, you had these people behind you and a team and a support system. And because of your confidence in them, it drove you forward. And you've applied that to your everyday now saying, hey, you know what? If I could do that, this is nothing. Like you've taken that and said, if I could do that, picking up the phone to call somebody and say, hey, I need 14 rolls of grip tape. You know, it's not a big deal. You know, that it's, I think that's what you're getting at. If I were to play psychologist for a second, you know, uh, I think that's yeah, yeah. where it comes from. Yeah, I think it is. And it's, um, it does help. And I, and I'm, I am working in, um, I am working in a, in a small team on, on this project at the moment. And I think, I think what it is, you know, when we did seven marathons, all six of us were as dedicated to that project as each other, you know, we're really committed to it. And that's what's happening with this project that I'm working on at the moment as well. There's there's only two of us, two to maybe th- two three of us, uh, and and we're really committed to making it happen. And so, working with those people really helps drive me on. And I, and I know that about myself. And I I'm trying to exploit that really, or, or try and put myself in in those situations because I know that's when I'm going to thrive the best. I would almost offer you this advice: go get a mentor, who's who's invested in your success as much as you are. Not that they're there every day, but they're invested in your success. Finding a mentor who's in, in really invested in your success in this project probably will help get you get on the way you, you did with the seven marathons. That is great advice. I've been working in TV for, I say, eight, eight nine years now. I c- kind of self-appointed two mentors fairly early on. And they've been absolutely invaluable to me at different points to, to for advice for just to just to to learn from from them and, and what they're doing and they, they do different jobs to me they're more producers and executive producers but for for that kind of impartial advice it's it's absolutely it's so valuable i cannot recommend that highly enough yeah it's a that's a it's a really good shout scott i think and it's and yeah and you're right and you're right that that mentor doesn't necessarily have to be someone senior to you. Mm-mm. Absolutely not. It's someone to bounce those ideas off. I think that's a really key point. So let's consider some of those engineering students out there who you may may hold very near and dear to yourself because they, they're, they're traveling hmm. down a path that you were traveling down. What advice would you offer them in helping them get a better start in an engineering career? So to reflect on, on what we talked about, Scott, I would say as you are embarking on 
your career in engineering in whatever field of engineering that might be, right? I think you have to stop and acknowledge how broad engineering is and how many industries there are that are dependent on it, how many jobs there are that require some form of engineering skills, even if it's not engineering per se. Because the skills that you acquire as an engineer are very analytical, they're very logical, and they are sought after skills in many fields outside of pure engineering. And I think you need to recognize that as an engineering graduate. And then harking back to something I was talking about earlier in trying to understand yourself better and understand your motivators and put those two things together in order to set yourself off in, in the right direction. And, and again, I'm, I'm kind of bringing together all the, all my answers from, from, from earlier on here, Scott, there's, there's a, there's this concept that I've read about that um, it's, 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 it's a concept of ready instead of ready, aim, fire, it's ready, fire, aim. And it's a concept that I think applies to, to many different things. I think originally it's applied in business. And so it's, it's talking about, let's say you've got a project and you're working on that project and you want to launch it or a product even. You're working on that product and you want to launch it. So, you know, ready, designing a project, getting prototypes, testing it. Aim, making sure everything's in place. You've got your marketing, your PR strategies, all this, your manufacturing, your logistics, blah, 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 making sure everything's in place. And then when, when everything's absolutely perfect, then you hit the trigger and you fire. That can be a huge source of uh, missing, missing the market because you've waited too long and the opportunity is gone. I'm a big fan of this concept of ready, fire, aim and i have to work at doing that because as i talked about earlier I, I am great for kind of not procrastinating but i i like making sure that everything is in place and i think engineers generally suffer from this um in fact there was i was reading an article in forbes magazine in preparing for for this scott and it, it talks about engineers having an uncontrolled ability to add more features so like <laughs> and it's talked about many, many and, and, and I thought that that kind of encapsulates it. You know, they just want to go, yeah, but oh, we could do that. No, 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 just do bang, get it out there. Then you can have more features later on, but you, you, you can miss opportunities. So right. I think, and I'm speaking, and I'm speaking as a stereotypical engineer. And I appreciate that not all engineers are like this. I have engineering mates who, who are, they almost like fire ready aim. I mean, there's, there's mm -hmm. one guy I, know, I went to university <laughs> with. He's, he's an entrepreneur in, um, inventor. It means that he's got a great brain for bringing these new product ideas. Um, but I think, I think engineers, engineers typically can suffer from that, that need to kind of just keep adding features and keep wanting to make sure that everything's perfect before they, before they hit go. And I think there's a bravery and there's a confidence that's needed to actually say, do you know what? This is good enough. Let's get it out there. We'll figure out the problems afterwards. And I think that is also a really, really good approach to, um, to, to, to life generally, to, mm -hmm. to your job, to your career, to, to a task and, and to life generally. So I think, I think I'd, I'd be cautious of that as, as, as engineers as well. Um, and, and being bold and brave to, to, to just put yourself in that direction, um, that you feel you're going to get those rewards that you feel you're going to be motivated by and don't worry too much about making sure you've got everything in place before you do that be bold be confident rob i couldn't thank you more uh for coming on the show today i know that your insight and your experience is going to be valuable to the students who listen to the podcast and i hope that you know when i hit 50 or 60 shows you come on again and do a repeat um scott i'd love to and i'm i'm, I'm so supportive of, of what you're doing um careers advice and getting getting um young adults off on the right foot is something i'm really really passionate about and especially um when it comes to engineers as well because as you say that is close to my heart so i mean hats off to you scott i think what you're doing is absolutely brilliant and um you know more power to your elbow thank you sir have a great day cheers scott take care